Hey everybody, long time no see. It is your boy BQ back on the scene, back up in the place to be with your Impact Lounge Impact Wrestling review. If you didn't catch the upload that I did last week, I was on a very brief vacation out of town uh, back in the motherland of Southern California. Uh, so thank you to everybody in the comments who, uh, you know, wished me well and, and wished my daughter happy birthday. We were celebrating my daughter's 11th out there. Uh, whenever whenever it's her birthday, we always got to go back and and uh, see the grandparents. And uh, we did it big. You know, what I mean, we did Disneyland, the beach, barbecue had a real, real, real nice break. Um, and I call it a break because I really disconnected myself from wrestling in those those four days I was gone. I did not watch last week's episode of Impact. I listened to Mike Gilbert review it and that was it. So uh, it's it, when I do deliver my review tonight, if I appear to be a little off on a couple of things or just my assessment of something is a little bit off, that would be the reason uh, just because I didn't watch the actual episode. I just I just listened to it being reviewed. I just can't. I, I've, I've said this a lot. I can't watch that much wrestling in a row. So to watch two episodes of Impact in a row and listen to Tom and uh, and Matt, Matt Raywald's voices for like three, four hours. I, I cannot do that. Much respect to those of you who can. So, um, But as I said, I, I kind of called it a break because I disconnected myself. I didn't watch wrestling. I stayed off uh, social media for the most part uh, when it came to wrestling. Kind of turned off my DMs because I get a lot about wrestling. I took, I took a nice break because what happened was uh, Thursday morning, so from here to Vegas to Southern California, where I'm from, is about a four-hour drive. It's not too bad. To get there after the drive, you know, uh, turn on the phone, go to Twitter. And, I mean, it's – I might have my timeline off here a little bit. I just know it was some point through, at the very beginning of my vacation. But I get on, and I see some shit between Taz and Jordan Grace going down about using a quote. I see – because uh, this is Thursday, people making excuses about AEW's ratings the night before. Uh, TNA fans completely unprompted, talking about, you know, people don't want to recognize Kurt Angle had his best years in TNA. You know, it, it, not that that was a toxic post, but I, I guess what I'm saying is, man, I just I, I said, you know, I got to get out of this wrestling bubble for a little bit. I just don't want to hear about wrestling. I don't want. I don't want to see wrestling. I don't want to see people playing about wrestling. I don't even want to see people praise wrestling. I just want a break for a little bit. And I, I tell you, it was really therapeutic. And I, I recommend it to, to anyone, you know, just man, stay off fucking Twitter for, for 48 hours. You know, um, I know it's not always, it's not as for everybody. It's not as financially feasible or geographically feasible to say, Hey, I'm going to go to go to the beach for the day or I'm going to go to California or Vegas or Florida. I, I understand that. But even if you're, you're out there uh, in the Midwest somewhere, if you're in the middle of nowhere, you're in Kansas, whatever, you know, whatever it means for you to just kind of like disconnect and step away from this stuff for a couple of days, you know, don't be afraid to miss an episode of, of whatever wrestling show you watch. Maybe it's just TNA. Maybe you watch everything. Shit, man. I, uh, I, I hate using the term mental health because it's kind of a buzz term, but it was really good for my, my mental health to just step away for a little bit and just just stop, just get out of the wrestling bubble. Stop talking about wrestling. Stop stop reading and listening. You know what I mean? Didn't listen to any podcasts or nothing like that for for a couple of days. Uh, you know, it's hard not to me for me to go down like my Vince Russo or my um, Jim Cornette rabbit hole. Like sometimes I'll just listen to a lot of their content when I'm bored. Uh, it, it was kind of hard not to do that because I really enjoy what they do. But uh, I, I do recommend to any of you guys, especially because Twitter is so freaking toxic and the wrestling fan base is toxic in general. And maybe it's become an everyday part of your life and, and you participate in it and you don't realize whether, whether you're taking it or dishing it out, whatever. Maybe you just don't realize how much it consumes you in a day. And just to step away, you know, if it is, if it means like go to the zoo for a couple hours and then go home and, and just watch something else on TV, you know, something I, I, I know this is a long opening here and you guys want me to talk impact, but uh, 
one thing I've been doing recently is I started the the. Uh, I'm not a big comic book guy. I'm, I'm not a comic book guy at all. But I started the Marvel movies from the beginning. So I went online and said, "Hey, what's the, what is the order to watch them?" And so that everything makes sense. And uh, I've been doing that. You know, just just really really disconnecting myself. So sorry that was like a five minute uh, rant, and I, I don't typically open my shows like that, but. I had to get off my chest a little bit. We're here to talk impact. We're going to talk some some impact uh, from what I thought was a fairly solid episode. There, I, it um, it had some misses for me. The misses were kind of minor. There's a there's a format to the television show now, and it's become nothing's clean. Nobody beats anybody except in the main event. And if you want to see people beat people and you want to see clean matches order the pay-per-view that's that's the that has become the new formula i don't know if i like it or not i know growing up if if you're like my age okay we grew up off squash matches and to get any kind of match where it was you know hacksaw versus sergeant slaughter something was a real big treat if you're turning into tuning into wrestling superstars and you got a a feature match that was a huge treat but back then, a lot of those feature matches didn't have clean finishes. They, there was double countouts, double disqualifications, or someone got themselves disqualified or count. I was, you know, it was a formula that worked once upon a time. I, I I don't know if it works right now. I think it's okay to have an episode, you know, a match every episode that ends like that. But it, it just seems like in the last, I can't speak for last week. But in the last two, three months, it just seems like everything is someone coming down and and distracting or something happening after the match or no one just no one getting a clean, clean victory. You know what I'm saying? So um, I, I just I haven't decided yet if I like the formula. So, but let, uh, yeah, let's talk about this episode. I'm not going to get into any news over the last couple of weeks because, again, I, I disconnected myself. I don't. There was probably stuff that happened, and I'm I'm completely clueless to it. So again, as I said, bear with me a little bit. If if some of the things I'm saying uh, doesn't jive with what happened on last week's episode, I apologize. Uh, but I, I do not plan on going back and watching that episode. I've heard enough, and I kick out and all that shit that I can handle for this week. I saw in some of the comments when I did my video when I let people know I was going to be on vacation and not reviewing the show last week. You know, I asked some people, what do you like and not like about the show right now? And, uh, you know, someone brought up Tom Hannafin. I can't, I don't like Tom Hannafin's voice. Someone told me the other day, well, he's got a radio voice. And I, I was like, he is imitating someone with a radio voice. I think that's, for me, the best way to put it. So that's why for some people, they can listen to him and it's, oh man, I love how he sounds. And then there's some people who are like, dude, this guy's voice is getting on my nerves. You know what I'm saying? But as I always try to say when I <laughs> when I make my Tom Hannafin comments, he does do a very good job, and, and the content of of the things he says is um, insightful, and he, he he does add a lot more than what we were used to over the um, the previous years before he he got on board. He likes to do this other thing too, where he puts emphasis on the most random words that don't need him. Uh, you know, in the main event, he was talking about Jake. He's like, uh, Jake something returned to this company last this time last year. And I'm just like, why Why did return need that much emphasis on it? And the first time it ever stood out to me, they were, they were promoting some set of tapings. <laughs> and he's just like, there's going to be a fan fest. <laughs> the effort... The, the the energy that he put into that word, the the, uh, the emotion and passion was so unnecessary. It just kind of made me laugh. But um, you know, I'm always gonna uh, pick shit out with the commentary. A fan fest. All right. So this episode kicks off when we get Trey Miguel versus Leon Slater. I wrote here in my notes. This is a random match, so it's not gonna end clean, or it's, there's gonna be it's gonna be a no finish. Like I, I wrote. I don't even know exactly what I wrote here. Uh, I'm not going to dig through my notes like that, but I, I wrote something along those lines. Random match. Usually when TNA gives you these like really super random matches out of left field, you're not going to get a finish. That is just what they do. 
So um, I like Leon Slater a lot. This guy's got a lot of talent. Uh, visually, this match, Trey Miguel was the heel, and he's like half the size of Leon Slater. Leon Slater's deceivingly tall. When you look at his graphics, you're think you, his graphic, you think you're looking at someone who's, you know, five seven at the most, and this guy looks like he's. <sighs> He's at least 5'11", I think. I, I could be wrong. It's it's kind of hard to gauge on TV sometimes. He's pretty tall, though. And Trey Miguel, who I would imagine is about 5'8", you know, Leon Slater completely dwarfed this guy. Is that the right term? Dwarfed him? Is dwarf when you're small? He towered him. Let's let's throw it like that. Let's, let, let, let's put it like that. And, uh, you know, Tom Hannafin says, the last time we saw Leon Slater, he beat the baddest man in TNA con on explosion. And I just said, wow, con is dead, man. Like con doesn't beat nobody. They tried to repackage him as this baddest man in TNA. And this motherfucker ain't won a match. I, 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 I cannot believe he's still on the roster. Like no shit. He dude is just straight up job. And even to someone like Leon Slater, who's talented, but has no, no character, no storyline, no nothing. Like they just threw this dude out there and he beat Khan on explosion, man. Khan cannot even win on explosion. That's insane. Um what I write here. Glad they used Slater here. Nice. Oh <laughs> sorry, my English was pretty bad here in my in, in my notes, but I was I was gonna say that uh I'm glad they actually used Leon Slater because I think he's from the UK, right? I don't know if he lives in the States or if they brought him over or, or what it is. You guys can educate me. I'm glad that they actually use him, unlike these winners from this sham of a contest gut check that every year is a complete waste of our time. So I'm glad that they're actually used this dude because when they announced that they signed him and people said, oh, he's so good, I get to the point, I'm like, I'll I'll just believe it when I see it, you know? Uh, so yeah, Leon Slater, very, very good. So they, these guys are having a, a very good match and I'm just waiting for something to happen. Cause I was like, this is too random. Leon Slater barely wrestles on this show. This is just a, a random ass X division match. So something, something's going to happen here. And sure enough, we get Charlie Dempsey from NXT who comes in and, and ruins a good match. And I put here who the, the fans knew who he, who he was. So I guess that's what is important at the end of the day. I thought the fans here sounded okay. I'm going to get off the match here for a second. Because they're they're in Philadelphia here, right? I hope that I'm not wrong on that. I believe that in this episode, they are in Philadelphia. And, you know, they're, they're passing images of the crowd around on social media. And, of course, people are sending them to me. And, like, look how many people are there. I don't get excited because... The show looks and feels exactly the same. That's why I was saying I don't, I can't watch two episodes of Impact in a row. It's because it's a very formulaic show. It always feels the same week to week. You know, it it just doesn't deviate from from its format. And it, it it's kind of like the it, with the crowd. It just doesn't matter if there's two hundred people there. There's four hundred people there. It just looks and sounds exactly the fucking same to me this show didn't sound any different than cincinnati where they're trying to say oh they were making no no noise it it sounded exactly the same to me i just have to throw that out there but the crowd knew who this guy was so that's what that's kind of what's important at the end of the day i don't know who he is um he looked like some knockoff of chuck palumbo uh tom hannafin got to hit us with his famous what the hell that's one of his Lines he's trying to get over. Uh, but at least the announcers are showing, you know, because c- he attacks both wrestlers. And at least they're showing outrage. Because I talked about a couple weeks ago when they put Steph DeLander through the table. And sometimes these situations happen on the show and Tom Hannafin calls them like a match. You know, like, oh, reverse. Oh, the clothesline, you know. If you watch, um, even if you don't like WWE, because I, I watch this, when they put Paul Heyman through the table, the announcers were were coming off genuinely outraged with what was going on and saying, someone get a medic out here. Uh, 
uh, at no point were they calling the moves or calling it like it was a wrestling match. You know what I mean? And Tom tends to do that in a lot of these attacks. So here, I I thought they did a much better job where they're they're kind of showing, even though it's fake as shit. They're 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 showing outrage. They're showing uh, they're, they're they're appearing shocked that this dude is out there. You know, and that that's kind of what I want to hear more of. So I thought I thought uh, commentary handled this very well. I think acting like they knew, you know, who, wait, is is that, you know, Charlie Dempsey? Like, get the fuck out of here, dude. I, I mean, I I would will, be willing to bet the majority of you did not know who he was. Um, I I mentioned to you guys as well that with this NXT partnership, this is what you're gonna get. All you people who think that they're sending Braun Breaker over. They're sending the Undertaker. This is what we're getting, okay? These these people from NXT where you may or may not know them. They're not sending their their big dogs. I got to say as well, I got Tatum Paxley. And some of you probably picked up on this because I was talking about her time at AEW. I got her confused with Blair Davenport. So uh, my bad on that one. Because she was B Priestley or, or something along those lines before. I got the girls confused. So uh, Tatum Paxley is not uh, Blair Davenport. So now I know that. Now I'm aware. Uh, but but as I said, I want I, as much as I complain about the commentary, I got to put him over too. That I thought that they handled this pretty pretty decently, other than magically knowing who this guy was. This is probably leading to some sort of multi-person match at Slammiversary, number one contender match, some something along those lines. I'm I'm, I'm sure it probably is. It's crazy. At one point during this episode, Tom goes two weeks from Saturday is Slammiversary. And I said, oh, my God, they don't have jack shit booked for this show. Now, I get it. It's in Montreal. They're moving seats. It's going to be the biggest crowd in, in how long? And they have the benefit, much like AEW when they went to do um, All In or whatever the hell's at Wembley. They have the benefit of saying, hey, we're coming to visit. People are just going to buy the tickets without knowing what's on the card. But that is exactly how they're booking Slammiversary, which is crazy because Slammiversary every year feels like the biggest show. The build, uh, everything to it, what they tease, who they're teasing is going to show up, the surprises, it always feels huge. It doesn't feel huge this year. We just know it's going to be huge because it's going to look good on TV because there's going to be a lot of people there. It's going to be loud. So we're excited for that. But if if this was taking place in um in Dallas, Texas, okay, somewhere in the United States, it would be like, are they building a TNA plus show? You know, if we're making just making all things relative, it the the build is like they're doing a, a, a TNA plus show. So that means over the next couple of weeks, they're just gonna throw a bunch of shit at us and we're just gonna get a a, a slew of these like random random matches that they throw together and the matches ever since December of last year have been really random on these shows. They've been, they've had no issue with packing half of these shows with like, we're just throwing shit together. You know, we got Matt and Rebby backstage. Matt Hardy now switches between regular Matt Hardy and broken Matt Hardy. So that's, that's what he's doing. I did. I did kind of pop when he said that queen Rebecca that it's been 284 nights <laughs> since she's wrestled in a ring. Um, I thought she, in the, in the little bit of a promo that she cut here, sounded very good, better than, uh, better than uh, jo Jody Threat. That's for sure. You know what I'm saying? Some of the girls on the roster, she sounded better than them, and, and this isn't even what she does anymore. Like she's has a little experience wrestling back in the day, but you know she she um. She's like light years ahead of some of these knockouts talking. <laughs> so then we get a Trey and Wentz yelling backstage. I thought Wentz killed this. Wentz sounded sounded great here. At first in my notes, I started writing, let, let's, okay, Trey Miguel, let's not pretend you know who this guy was that came and attacked you. Um, But then Wentz steps in and Wentz is like, hey, I was there before. I know who you are. I know how they operate. And I thought that was a really nice touch. I thought he delivered it with a lot of passion. I thought the smoke of you got him was really out of place. I know that's, that's their little tagline. Uh, that's a very popular phrase in the military as well. Uh, 
obviously we're talking about a different kind of smoking in the military, but I thought Trey throwing that in was really out of place because this wasn't some goofy backstage promo, but if you subtract that from it, if you extract the goofy phrase, it was a very well uh, delivered segment. Then we get a 10 minute challenge requested by Lars Frederick Fredrickson Fredrickson. He wasn't even there. He wasn't even like, he wasn't on commentary. He wasn't watching a match, nothing. Um, I had n- so little interest in this. Uh, Jobby threatened Danny Luza come out together, which I thought looked ridiculous. I understand they have the same theme song. Um, they do have individual theme songs too, though, you know, so I just thought you should have just, I just thought them <laughs> coming out like a tag team looked ridiculous. And then like, Oh, they're, they're going to fight each other, by the way. When they said this was a 10 minute challenge. I immediately knew that it was going to go to a time limit. There was a lot on this show that was very predictable. Really from show to show, we're getting that just really predictable shit. But as soon as they said it was a 10 minute challenge, I knew it was going to go the distance because the knockouts matches don't even go 10 minutes. If you, if you look at the timestamps on a, on a match from week to week, they're like done in like six, seven may at the most eight. So, I was putting here, this match shouldn't go over six minutes. And I was very disinterested in it. Uh, I think this storyline is horrible. But, 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 I do commend them for trying. Because you've got tag team champions who, you don't want them to wrestle too much. Because then you're, you're because Alicia's part of some big storylines with the system. So, uh, you don't want her doing like two storylines at once. They also don't have tag teams, so who the hell are they going to wrestle? So I commend them for doing for trying. They, they're doing something to try to build up this tag team. And what I don't understand is in this whole back to basics and shit they're doing, have they wrestled as a tag team versus anybody? All I can think of is both of them wrestling Tasha Steele's one-on-one and then uh, wrestling each other. So... Uh, the storyline stinks, but at the same time, I'm not, I don't want to give them too much shit because I, I appreciate that they're trying and that they're finding some way to, to, to build this story up. It's, it's building to a match. No one cares about, but at least they're kind of, they're building it instead of just rushing it. So I do give them uh respect for that. They're, they're at least attempting to, to do something here to have some kind of story. But um, ever since they went back to basics, so one of them beat Tasha Steels, one of them lost to Tasha Steels, and then they tied in a one-on-one match. So we're talking about uh, one win, one loss, and a tie. Somehow this is going to pr- you know, prepare them for wrestling the Militia at a Slammiversary, which they're probably going to win. Uh, you, don't, you don't go through all this for them to lose. I think the Militia should remain the champions forever. Alicia should never drop the title, but... Um, I, I don't expect Militia to to keep the titles at uh, Slam Anniversary. If this is this is indeed where they're going with it, which it seems like that's what they're doing. What's really weird is that it, it, it there's times where where Militia seem like they're on the, they're, they're completely come off like they're on the same page when when they're in the ring, but then you put them in some backstage angle or something, and it's it's always like teasing dissension, and I. I've I've brought that up a a few times. I repeat myself because I always have different listeners. So I just, I just don't really like that. I wish they just, you know, I thought that uh, Masha would get a nice rub interacting with the system, but not being part of the system. But it's like the system doesn't like her, which I think is a complete wrong direction to go. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know. I can see, I can see them, um, at Slammiversary losing to Spitfire and Alicia, you know, slapping her or something like that. And then they, they break up because what I think is going to happen is I'm really back and forth on this Ash and Jordan stuff. But what I think is going to happen is that Jordan is going to win at Slammiversary and then put over uh, Masha at Bound for Glory. And then I think Jordan Grace is going to be done. So that's, that's kind of where, where I think, Things are going to go, um, you know, can can 
can Masha work as a baby face? Cause they've delivered her as she does not know English, you know? So, um, we'll see if that's what they do. I, I think with killer Kelly, I don't, I don't want to come up that I'm reporting something because I have very little information on this. I mean, very little, um, I mean, I was basically hit with a no comment. I don't think we're going to see Killer Kelly or Hammerstone back. I could be totally wrong. Again, I'm not, I'm not reporting anything. I'm not even trying to read between the lines because I was really given almost no information on this uh, when I when I try to look into it. I have a feeling they're done, both of them. And I know that sounds really weird. Uh, Killer Kelly probably makes more sense. I know that sounds really weird for Hammerstone, and I could be completely wrong, and this dude might show up on next, week, next week's episode. I don't think we're seeing either of them back. So um, just keep that in the back of your mind. We're going to see what happens. Hopefully they're both back. I like them both. I love Killer Kelly. Um, but I, I have a feeling they're done. I don't know what happened. I think they're done. Um, but yeah, so they, they go to a draw. Let's go back to this match here, this fabulous match. They go to a draw, and the crowd is chanting five more minutes. I said, please, no. You know, like they, these two have no business wrestling for 15 minutes. And then they grant him the five minutes. I'm like, oh, my God. And um, thank God the militia comes out and interrupts them and attacks them. So we got back-to-back -back attack angles, back-to-back non-finishes, basically, to – kick off this show. I don't think you're drawing new viewers like that. I, don't, I think if you're tuning in for impact for the first time or for the first time in a long time, I don't think your first two matches ending like that are, are doing anything for you. I understand you think you're building storylines, but I, I just, I don't, I don't think so. They had a really nice uh, backstage here with Ali. This was the Santino show. Oh my God. This motherfucker was everywhere. But Ali tries to retract his challenge to Mike Bailey. Uh, I think they already announced this match, right? Because I thought I saw the graphic. But um, he retracts the challenge to Mike Bailey, which I thought was kind of funny. But then, uh, you know, he says, well, he, you have to earn championship matches around here. And Santino's like, that makes sense. You have a point. Next week, there'll be a number one contenders match. So yeah, we're getting a number one contender match. I thought storyline wise, if if Santino, almost like taking a page out of the Scott Demore book, would say, okay, you're right, he does need to wrestle someone. Uh, next week he'll wrestle Campaign Singh for the number one contender. Like I, 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 I kind of would have gone that direction rather than what they're going to do, which is going to be a fun wrestling match um, with two people that probably don't need to be losing matches on TV versus um, Ali. Then we get ABC with a very 1990s MTV promo. I thought Kurt Loder was going to pop out. Or Tabitha Soren. I'm dating myself with those references. They use these same 90s um, freaking Say by the Bell. Uh, I don't want to call them graphics, but I don't know what the hell they were doing. Uh, effects. They used that for Spitfire about a month ago. So that's, I guess, once an episode now we're going to get a 1990s uh, promo. After this, we get the return of one of my favorite on-screen characters, Dr. Ross. Um, you know, Ross took very good care of my myself and my family at the two TNA pay-per-views, so I'm definitely not directing at this him, directing this at him. Um, the acting was not great, but we're back to you know this is creative. I'm talking about here. We're back to phony characters on TV. I thought uh, we started getting away from that when they when they rebranded the TNA. But this goes, this supports something I've been saying is that the, the current product, although better than 2023, is more like Impact Wrestling than it is any era of TNA. I've said that a few times. And and this is this is giving us more of that. You know, so we're we're kind of back to the uh, the phony on screen characters. And there's spooky shit, and um, like this episode's not off to a great start for me because of that. Um, I was confused here. I rewound this because I said, surely there's going to be something to hear that says, hey, two weeks ago. 
was no was no assessment of Steph Delander done in the last two weeks. Was she in a coma? She's wearing the same outfit. Was she was Steph Delander in a coma for the last two weeks? Is, is or you know at the at the venue? It, didn't the venues change here? Haven't have, haven't they traveled from Cincinnati to Philadelphia since then? So um, yeah, this this happened two weeks ago, right? Let's pretend it did. And then um, PCO like brings her back to life. AJ and Rich Swan are in an empty bar. God knows where. Uh, maybe it's in the venue, but guess who just so happens to walk up in the middle of this? Santino. He's everywhere. He's walking the halls. He's in his office. He's backstage where the interviews are taking place. He's at the bar. This guy is everywhere. He's, backstage segments are just, um, man, it just... It's just phony when you do shit like this. You know what I'm saying? Like Santino, Santino was all over the show and he was everywhere. He was everywhere in the arena. So he just happens to walk up and at Slammiversary, we're getting AJ Francis versus PCO. And then uh, AJ Francis is going to defend the title next week. I wrote in my notes, it's probably the Rado kid getting his contractually obligated rematch, but it's Rhino. So we're getting AJ versus Rhino next week. Um, I would be willing to bet that before the match happens or during the match, it's it's somehow going to become a street fight, old school rules, no disqualification. I'm, I'm sure I'm sure that's the the direction it's going to go. I I understand Rhino was part of ECW once upon a time. I know that I was a fucking teenager when that show was on. So does this audience really want to see Rhino out there? Who knows? Um, Broken Matt and versus and Queen Rebecca versus Alicia and Eddie. I was really looking forward to this. I enjoyed this. It wasn't the best wrestling match in the world, but uh, I was looking forward to it. I was looking forward to Rebecca Hardy wrestling and just um, I like the husband and wife tag team type of thing, you know. So uh, I was into this. For me, the episode kind of picked up at this point. I'm not going to say it was like bad up to this point. I'm just saying if you were tuning in for the first time or for the first time in a long time, I don't know that uh, this did a lot for you. Um, oh, before this, I'm sorry, they had a really, really good Santana and Frankie Kazarian video packages where they were stating why they needed to win this this match and go on a anniversary. So I like I like that. I want more of that kind of stuff. Um, but yeah, Broken Matt and Queen Rebecca versus the Edwardses, the Hardys versus the Edwardses. Uh, they did a poetry in motion at one point, and it scared me. I was really afraid uh, Har- Rebby was going to slip. Even though this wasn't the best match in the world, I I did enjoy it. I, I enjoyed watching this quite a bit. Rebby showed a really nice spinning heel kick at one point, but I understand she's been out of the ring for a long time. But she is a trained wrestler, so she, or at least was at one point, so she kind of knows what she's doing out there. I would have liked to see more from her offensively because I think she could have probably handled it. You know, like if you're, she used to be a wrestler, she's in amazing shape. You know, can you take a couple weeks to train and learn some shit? You know, um, I remember when Stephanie McMahon, once upon a time at Slammiversary trained for a match with Brie Bell and Stephanie hadn't wrestled in you know, forever before that. And she looked better than Brie in the match. Because she put a couple weeks towards training. Um, I was kind of hoping we were going to see that here where Rebby Rebby busted out some shit. You know what I'm saying? But I thought the spin, spinning heel kick was good. She tried to do a leg drop to the back of Alicia's neck at one point. That was awful. Uh, but her poetry in motion looked very, very good. Um, there was moments in this match where Alicia and Rebby were in the ring together, but nothing was happening. And that for me, that was the real negative of the match. I don't know how to explain it. And maybe you guys understand what I'm talking about, but it just seemed like they were in the ring and a minute would pass and no no move has been been, been done. It's like they're they're holding each other, they're grabbing each other, they're taunting, they're teasing, they're talking, and Frankie and Eddie are pretending to come in the ring and all this shit. It just there was just moments in this match where it's just like weird 
almost like rest spot type of just shit. Like there was just nothing happening. And this happened several times throughout the match. There was times where Rebecca was in the ring for long periods of time, but no moves. She wasn't doing anything. Well, I should say Rebecca and Alicia, they were in the ring for long periods of times. No one was doing, they were just weren't doing moves to each other. It was just, it was strange. It was really hard to explain. They tried to do a heart attack at one point, which did not look good, but, uh, Props to that. Matt Hardy is in pretty decent shape for his age. Uh, I I know with someone who's a little older now that it can be very uh, difficult to stay in shape. It's difficult to have the body you had a decade ago, whether you work out or not. Um, But Matt looks pretty good. And it just, there's no excuse for Eddie to to not look better. You, You know what I mean? Uh, it, it's actually very disappointing. It, it's almost like this company has a a group of people that are very comfortable. They know they're not going anywhere. They're, they're very they're very comfortable, you know. Uh, the Hardys win this match, so they beat the team that has two champions on it. You know, you go back to the champions challenge where all the cha- all the champions lost. Remember when a couple months ago, the system couldn't lose. Now they can't win. Only one winning is Dango. <laughs> so, um, yeah, th- this match, as I said, it wasn't good necessarily, but I was really entertained by it. And I was kind of soaking it in because we were probably not going to see Rebecca in the ring again unless they do her versus Alicia, which I said will probably be the worst uh, match of all time. But we'll see. We'll see if they do that. I, I don't think so. I don't think we're going that direction. Uh, Brian Myers did come out during this match. So this was another match where someone attempted to get involved, but the the referee uh, kicked them out immediately. And Myers goes backstage looking for Santino. Santino shows up magically, of course, uh, immediately. Uh, ABC walks up magically out of nowhere. And uh, they have made a match for next week, Myers and uh, Dango versus the ABC. Remember, I'm saying the excuses for matches rather than, you know, something within the confines of the story. Brian Myers runs out there, gets kicked out immediately, goes backstage, pissed off about it, and Santino makes the match. It's it just, it's kind of just excuses for matches. We get Jordan. She did a very good job backstage talking about Ash by Elegance, but I still wrote, who cares? If, if who cares was a match, it's Jordan versus Ash. Jordan, red hot right now. She's almost Joe Landry levels of red hot. She's cooled off a little bit because uh, Battleground was, you know, a while ago. But I would still consider her red hot. And Ash, ice cold. I've I've talked about this the last few weeks that I think they just went bad comedy one week too many, one appearance too many. At the TNA Plus show, Ash would have laid her out cold and and was serious from then on out. We would have forgot the bad comedy. I, I promise you. Promise you, promise you, promise you. All the comedy that they've been doing for half a year, I promise you, if Ash would have come out and whooped their ass, we would have forgot about it all. The issue I have is that at Battleground, not at Battleground, I'm sorry. Yeah, it was Battleground. I'm sorry. Ash came out and took a chair shot to the head. So she, she's on her ass. The next week, Ash attacks Jordan, and she's on her ass again. Can you imagine, for those of you, again, a little bit older, you go back to, what's a match? Um, let's say Macho Man versus Jake the Snake. Okay? Jake the Snake goes to attack Macho Man one week. One week. Macho Man knocks his ass out. The next week, Jake shows up again. Macho Man knocks him out again. Who gives a shit about the match now? The baby face got his comeuppance twice already. Who fucking cares at this point, right? It doesn't care if Jake comes out the next week and, and takes him out. Like, we we don't care now. And That's what happened here. They went one too many weeks with this shit. Now no one cares. No one cared before, but they just had an opportunity and they missed it. Um, I know that they announced that Ash by Elegance signed with the company, 
But I've been kind of doing the math here. She showed up at Hard to Kill. And I don't remember at what point of Hard to Kill was. But I feel like from Hard to Kill to Slammiversary is six months. I, I'm Again, I'm not reporting anything. I wonder if Ash signed a six-month contract. And that's why they kind of kind of like when uh, Nick Aldis was only here for what two months or something. He got his title match at the end of that two months, not not early in the process. Because we're used to people coming from WWE and wrestling for the title and winning these titles immediately. This didn't happen with Ash, so I wonder if it was a short term contract. Hey, we're going to build you for six months, see what happens, give you your title shot, and then we're going to decide from there. Are we going to put the belt on you and boom? Or are we going to have you lose and you're, you're going to be done? I really think there's a possibility they're going to pull the pull the plug. From my conversations with TNA, I'm realizing they're going to be making a lot of more hard decisions now. I think under Scott, Scott was a little bit like Tony Khan. like He's hiring his friends. He's not going to fire his friends. This group now is not like that. Um if you guys hear the, these fireworks in the background, I'm sorry. It's freaking July 5th. What the hell? Thank God my dogs aren't barking at them. You guys, you guys are really lucky right now. Um, yeah, so to, but to go back to what I was saying, I think there's a possibility. Because I used to think that Ash was winning this thing. I don't think so anymore. I think there's a possibility she's going to lose this match. They're going to be done. And Jordan's going to move on. To Masha Slamovich, Masha's, Masha's, she's going to put Masha over a bound for glory. And then they're going to bullshit through TV the rest of the year. And then Jordan's like done at the top of the year. Whether she asks out, I know there's the rumor if she signed a 2026. I don't think that's true. I think she's, she's done top of next year. Um, so yeah, I don't care <laughs> to go back to, 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 to wrap all that up. I don't care. I don't care about the match. I don't think Ash is going to win. I, I think they've completely dropped the ball. She's not even on the fucking episode because she was booked somewhere over, you know, overseas. Uh, she was doing like world of sports or whatever it is. So that's why it just tells me like something, something's off. Maybe she's actually not signed. I don't know. I, I believe they said that she was, but I just I don't be shocked if, if she loses this match and she's done, because as I told you guys, she was already Evans kind of baby. And now that he's gone, is it going to be okay? We're going to, I don't want to say a repackage, but we're going to re refocus this character. Or are we just going to cut it off? You know what I'm saying? So um, I really would not be shocked if this was like the ash of the, the end of ash by awful sauce after a anniversary. I would not be shocked. And the reason I say that about Jordan's contract is because they typically their contracts usually run out after bound for glory or the top of the, or the end of the year. That's always the time where, where TNA typically seems to, um, the more long-term contracts where they seem to end is that like October to December timeframe. It's usually like October and then they'll just work without a contract the rest of the year if they do shows or whatever. But um, yeah, that, I've, I've been thinking about it. I think, I think we're going to see Masha there, uh, an attempt to make her the new face of the division. That's what I, I think is going to happen. I think uh, Kylan King actually would be a great face of the division uh, when that, when that time comes. And I think Killer Kelly could be as well. But as I said, my my gut tells me we're not going to see her anymore. I could be very, very wrong on that. Uh, I said it earlier in the show. My gut tells me we're not seeing her or Hammerstone on TV. anymore. And I know Hammerstone signed a contract. So that's why I could be very, very wrong on that one. But I, I just have a feeling. Um, What do we go? Oh, Jordan. So Jordan's doing another open challenge next week. They have no opponents for this woman. Like this is this is crazy, and um, I, yeah, we're not going to talk about. it. I think the, the spoilers out on that one. And they announced next week's episode, which looks interesting. I, I have no interest in AJ versus Rhino. I do have some interest because AJ's in it, and I care about what AJ does. But I have a feeling it's going hardcore, and at that point, I won't care. They're going to do Bailey versus Gresham versus Kushida. I wonder who's going to win this one. Uh, this is probably just going to. To, to you know Bailey's gonna win and then they're probably gonna try to get uh to to build not the build but use this this is the excuse to get Gresham versus Kashida at Slam anniversary I'll put it like that we got Tasha Steeles versus Giselle Shaw which uh I guarantee we're gonna get hit with a first time ever matchup on that one 
because I think it is. It's a very fresh matchup for the knockouts division. It sucks that it's just kind of like a throwaway episode, but I have a lot of interest in that. I'm trying to do this Giselle Shaw babyface thing. You know, oh, you know, I, I said Masha, but it is po- very, very possible that Giselle um, gets put over at, at Bound for Glory as, as the champion. That That's also very much a possibility if they decide they want her to be the, the face of the, the uh, knockouts division, which would be different, I guess. But I think that's a possibility. And, you know, I told you guys that she tried to walk away from the company. They convinced her to stay. Wouldn't shock me if they're like, hey, we'll put the belt on you. You know, does that work for you, brother? So, and then we're going to get uh, this Dempsey fellow versus Zachary Wentz. I don't know if this dude is a baby face, heel, whatever. I have no idea because he attacked everybody. But we'll see. We'll see um, what happens there. But I, I have some interest in that to see what this Dempsey guy is all about. And then I have a lot of interest in Tasha versus Shaw. So it looks like they got a, a nice little episode plan for next week. The main event here was Joe Hendry versus... Uh, naked Jake, Jake something. Jake, please put on something. Slip into something a little more comfortable. I knew who was going to win this match. I watched about half of it. Fast forward to the rest. And I, a very impressive Joe Hendry's choke slam, by the way. So uh, Joe Hendry wins here. And this was much like um, a couple of weeks ago. I told you I didn't watch Josh Alexander versus Eric Young because it's just going to be a long match. A long, good wrestling match. And I knew who was going to win. And I just didn't care. This was kind of a, a, in those. I, I like Joe Hendry a little bit more. So I was like, okay, I'll watch some of this. I thought Joe's opening promo was very effective. I think that's, this is the direction they're going to have to go with him. That just that kind of like opening um, rock promo where he just disses the dude. You know, I think that's going to work for him because he's not doing the songs like he used to do, you know, the song about his opponent. Maybe he'll, he'll he'll reserve those for pay-per-views going forward. I, I don't know, but he's not doing that anymore. So uh, this is kind of his version of that. And I thought what he did with Jake was very, very effective. I thought he did um, an excellent job. I didn't write down what he said in my notes, so my bad on that one. But I thought he did an excellent job here. Uh, he goes on to win this six-way. Now, I'm really shocked Santana is not in this six-way. Did we get sent? Did I miss Santana versus uh, Frankie Gazarian? I sure as hell did. I am so sorry. Um, we got to go back here. I'm I'm sitting here about to talk to talk about. I can't believe Santana's not in this match. Completely forgot this match. So Mike Santana takes on Frankie Gazarian, and this is the best match on the show by far. Um, and man, let's go back here. So yeah, this was three matches in a row. That ended with fuck finishes. Three in a row. Okay. I mean, and I'm sorry that I skipped that earlier, but this this was the third match. Fuck finish. Really, really good match. I had I had interest. This is different than Josh versus Eric Young, where I said I don't care because I cared who won this match. I didn't know who was gonna win a match. So I had a lot of interest in it. I would have guessed Mike Santana was gonna win. Um, but but Dango interrupts this match. And um, then Santana loses by count out. Okay, so Frankie Gazarian moves on. Moose had said earlier in the night that there's someone he was worried about. So they've given us, they've given everything away. They've given everything away. Uh, I don't know what they're going to have Mike Santana do at Slammiversary, but they've given it away. Moose is going to win at Slammiversary, and uh, his next opponent will be Mike Santana, whether it's Bound for Glory or it's TNA+. Plus. I think it's going to be bound for glory. Here's why I say that. So we're going to have this six-way match. And I mentioned a while ago, the reason I don't like the six-band match is because it's, instead of building something, like I say, hey, let's just throw everyone in a match. Let's be lazy. This this anniversary show has no actual storylines, good storylines that built anything here. You know, um, but we're going to see five of the top wrestlers in a company lose. At Slammiversary. That's what I don't like. Because now no one has momentum. But what I'm pretty positive is going to happen. I'm wrong all the time. Let me preface. I I know I'm always wrong. Moose and Joe Hendry are going to be the last two in the match. Moose is going to cheat to win. Joe Hendry is going to wrestle 
at TNA plus on TNA plus for the title. I think he's going to lose. And then I think they're going to do Mike Santana for bound for glory. So right away you're like, okay, so Joe Hendry loses. Okay. I thought we we're going to try to put the title on him. What did I always say when Scott Namor was in charge? Scott stays the course, right? Now, Scott is not the only man that works there. He's not the only one making decisions. He's not the only one. He was head of creative, but he's part of creative. I do feel that the same uh, the same thing exists, the st- that Moose versus Mike Santana was always where they were going for Bound for Glory. I've, I've had to think about this a lot last week. There was always where they were going. That's what I, this is what I'm, I, I think. Again, I'm wrong like 90% of the time. I get that. I think they always wanted to go Mike Santana versus Moose. Joe Hendry got popular. So now they go, okay, so we got to start throwing Joe Hendry in some main events. We got to throw him some bones. I don't think they're going to put the title on him. I don't think the plan was to do it. And I don't think they're going to do it. Now you can argue Joe Hendry doesn't need the belt because he's over. And six six months from now, we we may look at this and say, wow, they dropped the ball with Joe Hendry. I don't know if Joe Hendry works as the champion because Joe Hendry's over, but only like 40% is is what he's done on the show. 60 was the fucking song that happened off screen. So I right now I'm not sure that he's gonna work as a champion. But I think they're they're doing a good job in Again, him coming out and and getting on the microphone and verbally berating his appoint, opponent, right? I think that works. I think that's an evolution from him being sing-songy and comedy. You know, I think there's an elevation there. But I think they're going to... Um, I really think there's going to be the last two. Joe Hendry's going to, at that point, lose and wrestle on TNA+. Plus. And lose. That's that's really what I think is going to happen. I think the plan is always Mike Santana, and I think they're going to stick to it. Uh, and I think Mike Santana will win at Bound for Glory. But I think that this company just sticks to the script. I don't I don't think they deviate. I don't think they're going to deviate for Joe Hendry either. It's it's taken me a while to come to that conclusion because people ask me all the time, "Do you think Joe Hendry is going to be champion? When do you think he's going to be a champion? What, what do you think the you know?" People were saying, "What's the main event for Slammiversary going to be?" And I didn't know. I didn't know they were just going to throw everybody into it. And then they asked, "What do you think Bound for Glory is going to be?" We're always trying to forecast and fantasy book and you know decide what's going to happen. This is the one part of the show that is not obvious. That is not you know like the, there's a lot predictable about this show in general. This is not one of them. But the best predictor of the future is the past. And that's why I say I think they are going to stick to the script. Santana at Bound for Glory, I think he's going to win the belt. And Joe Hendry, we're going to look back at a few months and be like, they dropped the ball with Joe Hendry. That is that's that is what I think is going to happen. I think the company feels he doesn't need the belt. I think he's going to do some stuff on NXT. So they feel like, well, that's enough. You know what I'm saying? So we'll see what happens. <coughs> Excuse me. Let me. Take a this mango orange sun kiss, folks. Woo. Shit's good. I don't drink a lot of soda, man, but I had to go with it tonight. I was out of juice and water in the house. So I was like, okay, let's, let's, let's pop this soda over open. But just remember what I'm saying right now. Let's see if Bound for Glory rolls around and if, if I'm right. If TNA Plus rolls around, it's Joe Hendry versus Moose, and then we get Santana after that because they have televised, they telegraphed, excuse me, that Moose is afraid of Santana. So obviously, there's something big planned between the two of them. Obviously, Moose is going to win his slam anniversary. He just told us he's going to win. Okay, had he not done that promo, then we would at least have the illusion that that Joe Hendry might win this thing. That's not what I expect to happen. That's going to wrap it up for me, folks. I'm your boy, BQ, and uh, I'm back in the saddle. Sorry that I had to take my time off. I will be taking time off again at the end of the month. I'm going to reiterate this on the next couple shows. I have my honeymoon at the end of the month uh, from when I got married last year. We pushed the honeymoon off to the summer. I got that. Uh, I'm going to be gone longer than I was for this mini trip, so you're you're definitely going to get a a week without content, and I will 
disconnect myself from wrestling that week. I promise you. It'll be the week after Slammiversary. So you still get your Slammiversary review, and then um, then I'll be out. At least I think so. I believe it's Slammiversary, and then I think I'm leaving the next couple days later. We'll see. I don't know. I got to look at a calendar. I'm your boy, BQ, and I'll kick out. And um, I will talk to you again soon.